Yeah, so thanks, Amitav, and uh, thanks the, uh, to all the organizers for arranging this wonderful meeting, bringing students from various disciplines together, and it's going on pretty uh, nice. So I'll be talking about first passage time in stochastic gene regulation. All the keywords by now you are familiar with and you know more biology than I do. So I think this talk as, uh, will be more kind of mathematical and technical than uh, that of a biology talk. Okay, so one advantage of uh, speaking in the middle of a meeting like this is that I can borrow concepts from various other previous speakers. So I'll be taking elements from Heiko's talk, the stochastic processes, I'll be taking elements from Kavita's talk on first passage time. I'll be taking elements from Arthi's talk, how to set up a chemical master equations. And I'll also be taking something from Amita's talk, will be two days later on first passage time. Okay, so this is roughly the outline. So give you a brief introduction on uh, the topic, the things I'm going to describe. We'll talk about uh, FPT in trans transcription. This is the first passage time in a transcription because the organizers requested to keep it pedagogical. So I have to take a toy model and then we'll be dealing with transcription and tra translation together, uh, which is uh, done by the small RNA molecules. That is one kind of regulation that I'll be talking about. Then I'll be talking about uh, regulation by microRNA, which is also a quite interesting phenomena. And, but all these things are done in eukaryotic cells and there's something in prokaryotic where there is no the division between the translation and transcription on a physical boundary. So they often occur together. So that gives more constraints in the dynamics. So I'll talk about couple transcription and translation systems. And if time permits, I'll be talking about first passage time in dividing cells. I see some of students from ICER and Kolkata and some of them I might have taught. And if they know that if they don't stop me during the lecture, I finish pretty fast. Anyway, so this is the central dogma uh, that we are quite familiar with. There are genes which are storehouse of information. They transcribe to give mRNAs, sorry. They transcribe to give mRNAs. This transcription takes place at a certain rate. And this mRNAs translate to give proteins at a certain rate. And all these molecules have a finite lifetime and they degrade. Now, what we are more interested in is that, so if you think of this process, it's like the birth death pro process that Sagar was talking about. There's DNAs, which gives birth to mRNAs, and the mRNAs uh, die. Then I would expect that if I monitor the mRNAs, if I stand in one corner of a cell, and I monitor the, as the mRNAs are getting produced, you can think this as like a radioactive decay and I'm collecting the alpha particles in my Giger-Muller counter, then you'd expect the statistics of this mRNAs will be that of a poison. Okay, but that was the belief for a very long time, but then the experimentalists become, experimentalists become clever, they are, they are always clever, they become more clever, and they could now track the mRNAs in a single cell by tagging them, and they monitor the numbers of mRNAs as a function of time. Okay, this is quite remarkable thing to do experimentally, and if I take these numbers in this cartoon, you will see that if I take them above a particular threshold, you will see that the, it appears that mRNAs are produced in bursts. So it's unlike a poison process where two events have a uh, time gap like an exponentially distributed. Here they have some different kind of distribution, the power law, and these are, uh, mRNAs are produced in bursts. And so then this transcription and translation, this process, you can think there's an all random binding, unbinding taking place. So this is intrinsically noisy. There can be external noise due to the environment, which all cell, uh, cells do see, but there's also intrinsic noise because all this bi random, this random binding and unbinding. And to, on top of that, there's another phenomenon that we observe, that experimentalists observe, that these are bursty. The questions that we are more interested in that, so when the, as the first passage time characteristics of such a problem is bustiness has anything, any role to play, okay? So this is the setup. So, so why do we need first passage time? Because you see, there are two things uh, in this problem. First of all, whether these mRNAs or proteins, they need to reach a certain threshold. And not so long ago, the Dekel and Uri alone, they have shown that at least in the LAGZ system in the E. coli, it is important that their proteins are at a certain level such that they trigger the downstream processing. Okay, so this threshold is important. 
Okay, but the, to reach this, that threshold starting from say basal value, starting from some basal value, I cannot wait for infinite to reach there, right? It has to be done in a certain amount of time because all the downstream processes are waiting for me, waiting for this pro uh, proteins to come in time such that everything can take place in a synchronized way. So I need to achieve this threshold in a uh, certain time. So those are my time set T1, T2, T3. And in, in statistical physics, we are often interested in the distribution of this time, which is the first process time distribution. Okay, then uh, we'll, as we emphasize again and again, the underlying process is stochastic, the random binding, unbinding taking place. So this will be a fluctuating numbers. So overall, I will be more interested in the distribution of these times, which is the first process time distribution. Look, in, in, there is a tolerance to that thing. So uh, what they have shown that it, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but the Woody Allen and what they have taken, they have taken then these numbers of the lag Z, this has some value with some tolerance, then, it's, uh, then only it can trigger the other downstream. Okay, so now comes the, uh, yes. Exactly, exactly. Level of tolerance, yes. So, okay, so, so let's start with the simplest uh, uh, scenario. So this is a uh, transcription of an mRNA. For keeping it slightly generalized, which will be slightly useful, I have taken the transcription rate to be a time dependent. If this is a constant, this is a very, our typical well-studied, but that model which you have which you have studied in statistical physics in various contexts. So since the process is stochastic, so we are interested in obtaining not a particular mRNA, but a population of uh, mRNAs. And I asked the, what is the probability of finding mRNAs in time t? And to do this thing, given this uh, dynamics, we set up the chem master equation or which Arthi was selling as chemical master equation. So this is nothing great. So it is just doing a very systematic bookkeeping of the probabilities. So I can have the mRNAs, the probability of the mRNAs are being gained due to transcription, okay? They are lost due to degradation, okay? And they can also give, uh, they can transcribe and leave the system and go to the higher state, okay? So if I do all this probability balancing, I get this master equation. And if I'm, if I go to the, con typically solving this thing exactly becomes often difficult. So what the physics, typical physics tricks, I assume the aim is the number of mRNAs are pretty large. So the one small increment in mRNA is small. So I can go to a continuum limit and which for, for this system gives you a very simple Fokker-Planck equation. Okay, and I think Arthi has already told you, so if, even if I can solve this uh, probability or a generator, sometimes it's called the generator, then if I integrate the thing and get the function, which I take a, which is a cumulative distribution of the first process time, and if I take a derivative, I get the first process time distribution. Okay, that's the ideal scenario if I can solve this equation exactly. Okay, this is all textbook material and also in this various talks, you have encountered such uh, strategies. Okay, very good. So you can solve this equation in various ways. In various ways, we find one convenient way to go to the Fourier domain we use the following answers. This answers has some motivation that I take exponential of certain things. So in one way, it restricts my, that's my probabilities that is bound between, is a positive number. And it's between zero and one, that will be taken care by the normalization. Nevertheless, you could have solved by various other methods also. So I can solve this probability distribution exactly. Well, you see, there's a means and the variances are now time dependent. They depend on some primitives, H1 and H2 which can be obtained if I give you what is the trans kt as a function of time. So if I give you this function, okay, which can encode all the transcriptional processes, how the initiation factors are coming together, all the regulations is somehow time encoded in this parameter. If I give that thing exactly, then you can compute these integrals, you can plug it over here, and you can exactly solve the uh, first process uh, time uh, distribution. Okay, that's the uh, idea. <coughs> So now, so let's, whenever you do a formalization like that, you should always do a sanity check. 
So you, I should go, go back one step and set, see whether everything is consistent or conceptually consistent if I take this transcription rate to be constant, our typical birth death model. Okay, it's very easy to compute the first passage time distribution. It has a tail of all the tail t to the power minus three half, which can be also matched with the experimental simulations. And the mean first passage time sums of the MC over KM. Okay, remember KM is our transcription rate. Now you can now see that this is consistent. The more the, I set the threshold to, it will take more time to reach there. If my transcription is more, then it's more likely that it will hit that boundary. Okay, so this is in that way is uh, consistent. Now we have, now we might argue, uh, why do we need this uh, time dependent rate? So you will see that this process, if I actually solve for the protein distribution, as I said, it's about the process for the constant rate, it will be a positive distribution. There is no busting happening there. Why so there is no busting? Fan factor is one. So if I want to see a bustingness in my protein, I mean mRNA dynamics, I consider a very simple modification of the model. I take my gene, can now reside in two states. <coughs> it can be either on or it can be off. Okay, so if it's in the on state, then only it can transcribe. or it remains silent. Now it is easy to see why this will give you like a bursty dynamics because with the time duration one over k of my gene is on and if my bursty is, uh, my transcription parameter is came, so this is roughly gives a area of this rectangle and which is like typical burst size. Okay, so without doing any calculation one can argue that if my gene is a resides in two states and on of model, it will give my bursty dynamics in the uh, <coughs> transcripts. This solution here, it becomes now easy. If I write the uh, <coughs> rate equations like Arthi was doing yesterday, I can, this is a very simple uh, equation, linear equation. I can solve for d on as a function of time, which can plug into the second equation. And now you see, now I can identify this rate as a time dependent rate kt, which is this, this particular form. And now in the previous slides, I have already showed you the general formalism can be developed for any time dependent rate. So I can use this time dependent function and get my exactly my first passage time mean first passage time and the variance in the first passage time. What is interesting over here is that, what is interesting over here is that my first passage time is inversely proportional to my, to my beta, that is my burst size. So it already gives us some advantage. I mean, I don't know whether a cell works in that way or not. If the cells produce embryos in burst, probably it can achieve its target faster Okay, and that might help a tight regulation of the downstream processes. Any questions up to this? Okay, very good. So now we bring the proteins into picture. So this is our birth death process giving mRNAs to that I latch on the protein dynamics too. So this is our translation steps. And you see there is no regulation here because my gene is always on. In that sense, I, this is my control case, which has no regulation or inner. The transcription regulation, I have this on off dynamics. Okay, so this some mechanism, some transcription factors enables the binding of the RNA polymerase such that the transcription can take place. And this I call the transcription regulation uh, model. The, all these models are quite established in literature. I guess some of you might have also seen this thing in various contexts. So in the post transcription regulation, the regulation is not at this gene level, but it as at the level of the after the transcription has taken place that it changes the mRNA into two states either active state or inactive state if the state is active then only it can translate okay and this usually this regulation is brought about by small RNA the tiny molecules which helps the ribosome to bind such that translation can uh, take place so given uh, these systems our strategy will be very simple. We'll be set up the corresponding master equations and we try to solve for the probability distributions. So as I said, so here there are, more, there are two candidates now. I am interested in finding what is the probability of finding M, mRNAs <coughs> and N proteins at time t. And if I again, as, as I said, these are not difficult, just do chemical, uh, I mean just uh, <coughs> do some uh, careful uh, bookkeeping such that I can balance all the probabilities to set up the master equation. I use dimensional parameters and I will typically in this entire talk work in the range where gamma m over gamma p is less than one. 
which is not a bad approximation because proteins are typically more stable than the mRNAs. So if I do all that thing, then all, you have also seen that use of generating functions. So here there are two variables. So there are the two auxiliary variables. So I, I will explain why this is useful. This technique is useful. So I will plug this f into my master equation, okay? And then I will get an partial differential equations in for, it's important, it's one dimensional. They're only first order derivatives, but they're uh, uh, in two in the dependent variables. So one thing you can see, if by some mechanism, if I can solve this equation, I will come how typically we'll solve this. If I can solve for this f, okay, and, and I'm only interested in the say protein, how the protein reaches the its particular threshold. So I will integrate over my x, I will retain my function as a function of z only. And if I take this nth other derivative, I recover my probability distribution p of n. Okay, that's the beauty of the generating functions. Similarly, I can suppose in many times, I don't, if I'm interested in the moments, in the statistical properties, I will compute a derivative, I will show what kind of derivative to compute to get the corresponding means and the variance and other moments as well. So these are called generating functions. These are also called moment generating functions. So, the, okay, and now as you see, uh, wonder how do I solve this kind of nonlinear equations, as I emphasize, it's uh, only first order derivatives. So, if you recall in all your plus two or BSC, whenever you encounter partial differential equations, the way the strategy to universal strategy to solve these equations is to write somehow break them into ODEs. You don't care if they are coupled, but you want to break them into ODEs, right? So here one one way of doing that thing is a method of characteristics. So I will find a characteristic curve in this x z plane along which I can represent these PDs as a, some coupled OD equations. Okay, so that is not, uh, that is the usual strategy. And if I do that thing, if I solve for the Fs with these approximations, then I can get my frame distribution in full glory. Okay, it doesn't look very nice, but uh, doesn't care, uh, we don't care because we will be finally interested in some statistical properties. So we won't be dealing with this ugly looking uh, object. It in involves hypergeometric functions, et cetera, et cetera. What we can show is that if I take a large time limit, that's why these guys had shown earlier, okay, then we get something, a negative binomial distribution. Negative binomial sh distribution should trigger two things, that it is definitely not gamma, it's definitely not poiso. So inherently my dynamics in the steady state is going to be busty. Okay, that's why we want to model. I want some simple modification, such as my protein dynamics is like a bursty, okay? And you can also simulate this thing and uh, numerically check this thing. I will come about the simulation if I get time at the very end of the talk. What is important is that, uh, what was done over here, is that you can write this protein, uh, mean protein numbers as a function of time, because you see this is a dynamical thing which is changing over time. And I can also write this variance as a function of time very compactly. And you see the steady state value depends on the ratios of the Km, Kp over gamma m gamma b. Again, let's do some sanity check. If transcription is more, translation is more, I get more proteins, so steady state increases. If gamma m gamma p degradation rates are higher, I get less number of proteins. And it also gives the bustiness, like I showed how those area of the triangle was, here the bust parameter will depend over Kp over gamma m. Okay, so this is an, and this is super poisonous you know, because if I take a fan factor, that is going to be more than one. So that also proves my system is going to be a busty dynamics. Okay, very good. So then I go to the second model, that is the three-stage model, and where the, there is a transcriptional regulation. I won't try to explain all the terms, but you have now, by now you have guessed what I can do or what I typically do is that write the master equation and try to solve that thing. Only thing it can be done in various ways, and this Pico and Weikert, uh, don't, though they didn't solve it for the full protein, they, but they were, this paper is quite remarkable because they solved this thing, uh, system up to the transcription level for the mRNAs uh, long back, I mean almost 30 years ago. And there, and I kept this, I could use a single genetic function, but for the historical, this thing, I have used two genetic functions. Genetic functions, you can read it in this way, so this is, F0 for, when, for the probability of finding M, mRNAs in mRNAs when my gene is on or when my gene is uh, off. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, off or on. Okay, I do some uh, dimensional scaling, etc. So then here also I will have two coupled uh, equations. 
of for f0 and f1. Again, I use the method of characteristics because luckily there are no uh, second derivative terms. So method of characteristics work, work fine. And of course, this I, I, I repeat that this approximation is crucial. Then I solve for f0 and f1 and my com composite generative function is the sum, sum of these two. And now see if I can, if I take a derivative of this genetic function with respect to z and say z equal to one, I read off my mean, which will be time dependent because I'm going to solve for the time dependent probability distribution. And this I, uh, and similarly I can compute the second uh, uh, derivatives so, so that I get the uh, variance. What is important that was uh, done in this work uh, uh, some time ago is that my, my mean protein numbers and the variance of the protein rem expression remains identically same. What changes is my steady state values, which and you can also see because Km over Kp, gamma m, gamma p was a steady state value even with the no regulation. Now the probability of this guy being on is alpha over alpha plus beta, so it just get reparameterized by alpha over alpha plus beta. But similarly, I can argue for the very uh, for the um, bus size also. Earlier, my bus size was Kp uh, over gamma uh, m. Now it's Kp over gamma m plus something. So my with the regulation thing, my things are getting more busty. Okay, so if something needs to be promoted, and something needs to be urgently synthesized, something needs to be, the uh, threshold needs to be reached with some urgency, it will just take this strategy of regulating the uh, in a on-off uh, sense. I will come, I will compare them everything on a, bring them everything on the same page. Yes, uh, there are some experiments like the Bindu and uh, Vidya Singh, they are working on some holine. The holine proteins, they could exactly see this kind of distribution in the first place. Okay, so now let's come to the the other kind of regulation which is happening after the transcription has taken place, so that is the regulation is done over here. I am not writing the master equation. Uh, uh, the same thing can be done, same strategy will be followed. And here also, you see the mean and the variance exactly follows the same dynamical equations, same dynamical evolution. And as usual, our steady state, what only changes is the steady state values and the bus parameters. Okay, so these are all in the limit that proteins are more stable comparatively more stable than the mRNAs, all this can be exactly uh, uh, worked out. Now, why do we do, do this thing? And we have, must have noticed, okay, so I started this talk by calculating the first passage time, but what I'm just giving you up to now is the mean protein numbers and the variance protein numbers. So why I'm not going there? Obviously, there are difficulties. If I have to solve for the extra, entire distribution, then compute the first passage time from the cumulative distribution, it's a nightmare. I mean, I couldn't do it. So I followed an alternative strategy and which is like some graphical method, which is approximate nevertheless for, for our kind of parameter regions is quite useful. So let's see how it can be done. Let's try to go this thing slightly slowly. I also confuse this. So, so this blue curve is my evolution of the mean as a function of time. Whenever it hits this threshold NC, which is normalized with a steady state value. Okay, so that is my mean first passage time, right? And this green are the various trajectories, various time evolutions. If I compute their mean numerical, this is exactly the blue curve will appear. Whenever it crosses this threshold, that is my first pass time, mean first passage time. Now, this blue curve is flanked on the either side by the mu n minus sigma n and sigma n t, which is the variance. Okay. So whenever this, so this, uh, what will be the first passage time variance? That will be roughly tr plus tl. Then I can write sigma, the variance of t at t plus tr, assuming that tr is not large, that will be the difference between mean first passage, uh, mean first passage by t plus tr minus t. Okay, similarly I can die and do it for the um, uh, left hand side also. Now assuming the tr, tr are reasonably small, I can do a Taylor series expansion, I can pull, I mean, uh, uh, rearrange the terms, and I can say my variance of the first passage time is roughly tr over t, tr plus tl, which can be now expressed as a time derivative of the means and the variances which I've often before. 
So I don't need to calculate the entire distribution to get the fastest system distribution. But you can see there are problems. I am assuming the TR and TL to be small, otherwise this expansion cannot be done. So I am saying that the variance is not too large, the protein numbers doesn't fluctuate too high, which is possible since I have taken gamma to be small. If the degradation is well, there are very, will be very few copy numbers. If the copy numbers are very few, the fluctuations will be more. And now you will also argue, okay, so how can I define this thing? Obviously, you can take, keep more terms here, more higher order terms here. So you have to compute more higher order derivative terms here. Okay, and this starts to get a much better approximation of the uh, mean of the variance of the first pass system. So for all the three models where we have obtained the mean and the variance, we'll uh, calculate the first passage time in the following way. And then as Devashish is asking, I can put, I put everything on the same page. So these are the various regulations. These are the various steady states. These are the corresponding protein bursts. And I can compute the uh, coefficient of variance, which Arti was calling uh, um, randomness parameter. Okay, so now, now you see I'm comparing three mechanisms, three different mechanisms. Okay, they, can, they might be triggered by various factors. If I now have to compare them, I have to bring them on the same page. Okay, if I have to be on the same page, I have to compare them at, by fix, keeping this steady state fixed. So I compare these three models, keeping the steady state fixed and, and adjusting the other parameters such that I can study this fast passage time as a function, uh, fast passage time noise as a function of the protein uh, uh, bus size. So it is very easy to see because this is Kp over Km, this is Kp over Km, this plus something, this will be Kp over Km which will be less than 1. So my bus parameters are ordered, my transcriptional regulation gives a larger bus size than non, no regulation than uh, uh, post transcription regulations. In a way, on the other end, the microphone, this uh, noise parameter is largest for the transcriptional regulation and is the least for the post transcriptional regulation. So, in that point, we are tempted to conclude in this paper is that my bustiness gives a very nice strategy to the protein or to the my uh, system to reduce my fast passage time noise. See, not, not only reaches there faster, it reaches there more accurately. Okay, but then you, you know in biology nothing comes, comes cheap. So then we, uh, if we order them in the KP, KM plane, okay, these are the transcription, translation rate is varied or the transcription rate is, a vary, uh, is varied in this axis. And the dashed lines are these, these isoclines are along which my protein remains constant. If I change both of them, if I go from one dashed line to other one, my protein steady state number is increasing. But if I go along this line, you can see along this my transcription rate is increasing. My transcription rate is increasing, my it's becoming more costly for the organism to maintain that steady state. And if I go along this line, I will uh, increasing my uh, precision, timing precision or the uh, fast passage time noise. So in this thing, I can order them. So uh, post-transcription regulations give me higher precision. It reaches there faster with more accurately. But then again, it's costly in the sense that my transcription needs to be done more vigorously. Okay, so this is probably uh, this is a way to put all of them, compare all these uh, different systems together. So okay, very fine. But then it was not very useful. Uh, we are not very happy because we thought that this thing, small RNA, can give you very without any constant will increase the accuracy, but it doesn't happen. So for what you do, uh, physicist trick, increase the dimension. Okay. So we take more SRNs into account. So in this paper, we take two SRNs simultaneously operating. That essentially gives you more degrees of freedom. Luckily, this also can be worked out exactly. The, again, the mean and the uh, variance of the uh, protein numbers expression remains exactly same. So all the calculations just becomes uh, radical job. And you see now I can, if I go along this line, I can keep my steady state value constant. But if I go along these curves, I can change the bust parameter. So there, even though the yield is not too high, but still if I follow the strategy in principle, I can independently regulate my steady state value and the bus size, and I can generally achieve more efficiency without affecting the cost of my transcriptional process. Okay, so this is uh, one uh, study which involves a small RNA. Then, uh, but this is not the only type of regulation that is possible. The regulations can also be done uh, with uh, 
microRNAs uh, in the following fashion. So this is too much biology, so I have to be careful. So, uh, so this is our gene. So there is a five cap region, you know. So there is something initial, initiation factor which helps to recruit these small units, uh, ribosomal units, which is called 40S. And then once it's bound, so this is my one parameter. One, this is my bound state, 40S as it binds to the mRNA, let's call that thing F. Then as, once it's bound, then it starts to move along this thing to find the start codon. At that point, it recruits another uh, element, says uh, ribosomal unit, says 60S, such that they together can go uh, move along this DNA such that protein is being synthesized, which is my parameter P. So this is the extent of biology that I understand. But what is uh, what I extract from here, there are, these are the para variables of my interest. That is my ribosomal uh, number, that is 40S. This is the bound state, that is F. This I call a some recognized, AUG recognized state, let's call that thing A. And this is of course my uh, protein. So this model is not ours. This has been developed, I mean, at least uh, more than a decade ago. And this is quite popular uh, in uh, studying the translation initiation process. Why I identify these particular variables will be clear in a moment. So you see, this is the so 40S that leads to F. F goes to A, that is my augmented state, which goes releases my 40S on this translation is over. And if I don't take the protein into account, this is exactly the rock, paper, scissors uh, system that Shagar was talking about. If I keep all the parameters of the same order, K3 of the order K2, K3 of the order K1, I get cyclic dynamics. Okay, it also gets heterogeneic cycle that he was talking about. Or I, I can write the uh, rate equations, and if I use this uh, in the in these four variables, but there, if I say the total number of ribosomes are constant, it just gives me some happiness by reducing get reading of one variable. Okay, so I have three variables to deal with, and the regulation of the microRNA, how does it regulate this system? There is various studies and uh, biologists, you know, I mean, they never agree with each other. So there it can be uh, controlled in various ways. It can control this K1 step. It can also, so let's go back. So it can hinder this process or it can hinder this process or it can hinder this process, okay? So it can happen at various stages. So, so I have taken a very simple uh, linear regulation. It can also be done regulation like Arti was talking about, like a Michaelis maintenance uh, type of uh, regulation also. Yes, please. So that is the total number of ribosomes, whether in the 40s free form or the bound form, they are constant. Yes, this guy. And here also this 40s is at us, right? It hasn't gone yet. So I, this is one free state, this is one bound state, and this is a recognized state. So our ribosome exists in these three states. Sorry, here it is free, here it is bound. This is also bound, this 40 years thing. I'm not taking into account the 60 years, because once, once this thing is already bound, I say that it's one step, zoop, it gives the protein. Okay, so th uh, there's another thing, I mean, which got us interested in this problem or why we were doing this problem is that these uh, caps can be there in two flavors in the, probably you know it better, it can be G cap or in the A cap states. And typically in the uh, A cap thing, the, these K1 rates are very small. That is this binding is very small. Okay, the initial factors can invoke the binding of the 40S in a very slow rate. So this K1G will be much, much greater than uh, K1A. Okay, that is one parameter regime that we'll be working upon or uh, working uh, with. Okay, okay, so the, I need not say this thing again. You know uh, what we can do. So interesting thing is that once we set up this uh, thing and solve for this protein numbers and the, its corresponding variance, you see the mean number doesn't change. It ex exactly is an exponential evolution like before. But you see the variance, there's a minus sign sitting over here, okay? So, so that is slightly uh, uh, satisfying because we know this, trans, this uh, microRNA is going to inhibit my translation. If it inhibits my translation, it represses the busty parameter, okay? So my variance is going to be less. So my statistics is going to be sub statistics, okay? 
So, uh, and you can also work out the exact distribution there are, uh, and you can calculate the fast passage time exactly. Since I know this thing, I can compute the fast passage time uh, noise, um, uh, randomness parameter. And I can show that here, if my bustiness for the G-cap state is larger than that of the A-cap state, my, unlike the previous study, in the transcription regulation, for the micro regula regulation, my fast passage time noise for the uh, G state is less than that of the A state. Okay, so this work was done with uh, Mohit Jolly, so who also gave a talk here, here in the, I think, in the first or second day of this uh, meeting. So, uh, okay, so, so all the thing, scenarios that we are discussing typically happens in uh, uh, eukaryotic cells, but as I said, in prokaryotic cells, uh, everything can happen together. Uh, so these are called coupled transcription and translation. So these, whatever I am going to say now, this is something I've been uh, working upon. So I'll be happy to take your inputs from you. So, so these are the various players. So here, typically here, the trans, uh, once the transcript has taken place or the mRNA is formed, it somehow migrates to the cytoplasm where the translation uh, occurs. On the other hand, since there is no nuclear boundary, so before the transcription is over, this um, ribosomes already uh, get into action to form these um, you know, proteins. Okay, so it's happening something uh, concurrently. So the idea for why using this coupled transcription translation model uh, is that we are, uh, in the previous studies, we have, in, we have kept all the resources unbounded. So somehow we need to put a constraint on the uh, system by using some uh, uh, coupled dynamics of this kind. Okay, so model that will be uh, using the constant is a very uh, it's a very special model. Uh, it's not a very general system, but here there is some uh, feedback loop where the RNA polymerase it's needed for its own transcription. So if my some protein is being synthesis synthesized, that acts as the its own RNA polymerase. Okay, so this is like a feedback uh, circuit. So let's go through this, uh, what are the various candidates? So these are my transcription factor, let's say sigma, which with the RNA polymerase binds to the uh, DNA, form, uh, reverse, reversibly forming this complex P of D. This P of D with some rate Kc forms a uh, nascent mRNA of length one. Then it recruits one by one nucleotides to elongate that mRNA, where once it reaches a length of L, it gives me the uh, RNA and it re releases the RNA polymerase, which is protein in our case, okay? And this, of course, this RNA can also uh, degrade. Once this RNA, the translation part take up this RNA, I use a prime thing just to denote that is an active state now. So this ribosome R now binds with this polynomial. This, this is a reversible, uh, reversible process. And this bound state with some rate K, uh, KW uh, starts, uh, generating the nascent protein, this is of length one, then with the help of the tRNA, it recruits one by one amino acids as the protein length elongates. And exactly when this is H, which will be thrice this uh, L, because these are amino acids, these are nucleotides, so that will give me, release, finally give me the protein, which again fits back to the system to initiate the transcription. So in a way, what we are trying to do, as we'll see all the, uh, you know, all the constants in a moment, so this feedback loop, puts a resource availability and which is the, this constant transcription uh, and translation uh, dynamics. So the, as you can see, there are various large number of parameters, but luckily most of the parameters are listed in literature. Uh, we just typically work on uh, those, uh, taking those numbers from various places. And now see what are the uh, uh, dynamical constants here. Because you see, these are the key players, that is the DNA concentration, or the promoter uh, concentration, protein complex, mRNA concentration, ribosome comp, uh, concentration, and the complex uh, um, rRNA, okay. So the C plus D is, is a, some constant, okay, because the promoter can either be in a free state or in a bound state. And here, these are the various uh, uh, ribosome states, because it can be as a part of a, uh, protein of length one, length two, length three, because these are nascent levels of protein, that these are the excess. Total RNA polymerase is constant. This is what we are interested in. This will be a fixed number. This will be the C, that is the complex that is formed here. This is P, that is the protein that is going, concentration of the protein going over here. And these are the various states of the Y, okay? 
these are the various states of the nascent mRNA okay which gives me like total conservations now let's have a look at the dimension so this has to be this l has to be thrice uh, h so this is typically the numbers that we get from literature is order of 8000 this is order of 2000 if i put everything here if i use this constant that only helps me by only one so that i have a large dimension system of 10 to the power 4 okay 10 to the power 4 if i want to do a dynamical simulations if i want to do a uh, runge kuta or something like that to get the protein dynamics i am fine but if i have to do a gillespie or something to get a stochastic simulation this will be a nightmare okay so somehow i have to do some strategy to reduce my dimension and our typical physics strategy use some time scale separation that's what many of our speakers were doing uh, on and off so we use a time scale separation to reduce my dimension so here i have listed all the variables so these are all the slow variables these are the fast variables so i say that mrna uh, nascent mRNA when it goes from recruiting one amino acid going from the length one to length two to length three this is a very fast process so I take them to be very fast so I can take them to be equilibrium values and they are reasonably stable so I can get rid of this so what I need so uh, all these things are in equilibrium value so I this guy over here this guy over here I can re exp uh, replace this thing by some equilibrium value kc over uh, kt uh, times c similarly for the uh, 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 translation dynamics I also take this, this all these uh, nascent uh, proteins are recruiting the amino, um, amino acids one by one at a very fast rate so all this thing will also be in their corresponding steady state so I will take this guy over here by the corresponding steady state value so I will have the six equations to be dealt with and effectively five because I can also get rid of one equation from here so that is called a, uh, so we often do this thing but there should be some dynamical system justification why you can do how this reduction is actually going to work so if i look at the transcription subsystem the c goes to p and all the this complex give rise to y1 y2 so on y l1 which again effectively releases my uh, protein so i can write the complete jacobian matrix calculate these leading eigen values find the global stability properties Okay, but then I am working with a reduced system. I have thrown away most, most of my dynamics, all the transcript dynamics, all the trans, uh, uh, protein, uh, mRNA, nascent mRNA dynamics I have thrown out. So how, how does it ensure my global stability of the reduced system is still okay? Because I will be going to do Gillespie. I don't want to end up with some wrong numbers. So this, there's a very nice theorem. I don't know whether you know this thing. Uh, see this, so you see, so my dynamical system is like x dot equal to f x y t. And then this is my other, uh, part of my system y dot equal to g of thing and typically when you do a reduction of system some of you identified my parameter mu a small parameter which is set to zero such that I have some x dot equation okay this is same thing and then I have an algebraic equation the trickle of error system says if this y is a stable root of this dynamical system okay y dot equal to g then my global stability of the reduced system is ensured it can be proved actually we haven't proved this has been proved in literature but this is very useful thing so you can uh, it can be checked for uh, this transcriptional uh, subsystem reduction and the translational subsystem reduction independently to show my global stability is ensured even if i'm working with this uh, six variables of my system so okay so these are my so i have reduced the thrown away most of the parts so what is uh, how the reduction in the in terms of the reactions are taking place so once the y is formed i assume the everything the y2 y1 y2 are so fast zoop from y i get my rna prime okay similarly from here these things are happening so fast once i get my x a protein of length one or nascent protein of length one in one step it gives me that full protein p okay so these are instantaneous steps so effectively i can write a very less number of equations uh, eight to be precise because there are two reversible equations on which i can do our uh, gillespie simulations to get the stochastic trajectories of these guys very good so uh, i think gillespie you know only thing uh, here uh, just for comparison purpose i also try uh, um, to match it with the full gillespie of the full uh, 10000 uh, uh, system uh, but then there are too many equations rates are pretty small so you cannot do a gillespie in the normal sense uh, gillespie you know okay very, very good so you, i use two strategy what is the adaptive tau leaping okay so this is very nice i'll just give you a why, why this so what is uh, if i don't know whether you use tau leaping or not so 
Gillespie gives you uh, uh, generates two random numbers. One it, with one random number, it finds which reaction to simulate, which re uh, reaction will take place, and with another random number with exponential distribution, which after what time that reaction will take place, right? So that is the purpose of the Gillespie. Tau leaping, what it does, it fixes the tau a very reasonably longer time, and then finds the, what is the probability of how many reactions will taking place within that tau. Okay, so in one tau step, it updates all the reaction uh, steps. Okay, so it's pretty fast. Obviously, there are problems because how do you fix this tau? So by trial and error, you have to fix this tau. Then adaptive thing is a very nice mechanism. So then what it does, if they find the variables are changing too fast, okay, like an adaptive winger kuta or something like that, it reduces this time tau. Okay, that is called adaptive tau looping. So actually, uh, I didn't know this thing. This adaptive tau looping algorithm was proposed by Gillespie some 15, 20 years uh, ago. Gillespie algorithm is pretty uh, old, but this adaptive tau is also the child of Gillespie uh, himself. Anyway, so uh, we can get all these trajectories to pretty accuracy, whether we go for the full simulation or for the reduces thing. And then we numerically calculate all the first passes times. Okay, whenever it reaches a particular threshold, we can compute the numerically its distribution. Analytical result I haven't gone yet. And what is interesting is that if I see the uh, if KC is the rate where the at the rate at which the promoters are free, so this is something like a transcription rate, this is something like a translation rate. And if I identify the, in these two parameter regimes, there is some nice regime, there is some nice uh, phase separation where in this thing when the this KC or KW is pretty small, so there is hardly any transcript under any protein, so my fast passage time will be almost infinite. And on the other hand, if there are some reasonable value, as I showed in the, the table from various literature values, they are typically give an order of minute. I don't know what is the physical significance or biological significance of this number. But interestingly, there is some crossover regime. Okay, so KC and Q, KW can be tuned to act, obtain a fast passage time with a desired uh, accuracy. Okay, so this is the thing that uh, needs to be uh, explored. So I have maybe five, 10 minutes or something around 10 minutes. So this is one thing that I want to discuss. Then another thing is that uh, uh, we can also put another time scale in the problem. The time scale at which the cells individually are dividing. So these are the a particular mother cell stays for a uh, before divisions. Uh, the time it, it remains uh, before it divides is some tau c. These tau c's can be drawn from various uh, the distributions. Typical distributions uh, people take is some Erlang distribution. Okay, and within this, uh, while this thing is dividing, but the process doesn't stop, transcription and translation are already taking place. So we are interesting as it divides, what, and if I monitor the cell for a few generations, I will have a number of proteins, whether that, in spite of this division, how does it reach a particular threshold in what kind of statistics do I get? Okay, that is the question that we are asking. So uh, here, uh, I can set up the entire master. Here, uh, sometimes, um, it can be, uh, calculation can be slightly simplified. If I say that it is go from n minus r state to n state, where I, I average over, or I sum over all the r, r values, okay? So here my variable I'm interested is that, this is my protein number with n proteins, okay? Probability of n proteins after generation j, because every generation I have to keep uh, into account, right? And here I don't, uh, and this QR, this is weighted by the corresponding protein bus distribution because if I take that is coming from some uh, distribution uh, uh, like this, so I could take, or you can take other distributions as well. So I will plug this distribution directly over here and then I use the same technique as before, generating function and compute this uh, uh, mean uh, uh, protein numbers and the variance of those protein numbers. So you see as my, uh, uh, if you have noticed, probably I didn't say that. Here for calculation simplicity, I've taken the proteins to be fairly stable. Okay, they don't decrease over this tau time scales. So it will keep on growing because there is no degradation. That's nothing that kills the protein. It will keep on growing as a function of T uh, plus uh, tau C. And here is the expression for the uh, variance, which will be some mean plus something. So it is going to be still remain busty. So you can plot this uh, first passage time as a function of the uh, mean number of proteins. And there are some uh, indications that, uh, that the, when the protein numbers, mean protein numbers are slightly less, the bustiness is, might be a good strategy to reduce this noise. 
there is some critical uh, protein number beyond which it is not. And on top of this, if I put the dynamical constants, it will be quite difficult, but it will be quite interesting uh, model to uh, study. Okay, so that's pretty much it. So, so just to summarize uh, various things, so FPT noise can be minimized in post-transcription regulation. The cooperatively in SRNA, whether two or three or more SRNAs are in play, that can increase timing efficiency without increasing the cost of the transcription. Uh, microRNA mediated depression can call also control timing efficiency. This coupled transcription translation or the constant transcription tr translation also tightly contains first process time, but this is only uh, we have numerical evidence, no analytical calculations so far. And long cycle duration also reduces the first process time noise. So most of this work was thesis of Kuheli, uh, who has graduated and now at Technion. These are uh, our SMS students. They have done PhD at various places. And the translation work was, that model was introduced to us by Mohit. And it was very nice working with him. And these are the funding uh, agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Ananda, for this very exciting talk. And I think we have time for questions. So we have plenty of time for questions. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, it's very impressive, large number of calculations that you have done. Uh, my uh, general question is, uh, have you tried to compare with experimental data of any uh, no, you asked me this before also, no, I haven't tried, but the, uh, I don't have a collaborator like that. But Dibbendu had been working with the Buddha Singh and all, they have matched it exactly. A simple, similar model of fast huh. process time with, as I said, that their experiment was done with holine proteins. Yeah, no, but you can, I mean, you don't have to necessarily collaborate with all the uh, experimentalists, but some of the results probably are published domain, so you can extract from. Distributions are okay, statistics of the proteins are fine. For uh, statistic of the first process time, I don't know how many experimental results exist. But you motivated initially with experimental results, right? I mean, yes, exactly. Though they are, part, uh, but typically uh, the regulation that they take into account is not not such simple kind of regulation. It's not like a uh, on-off regulation and then protein and then they have a more complex networks. Like the LAGZ system, you know, so it's more complex system. There are three or four lack uh, uh, proteins, so it becomes more uh, involved thing to do. Okay. Yes, please. Um, when, when you made the comparison of the three different regulation mm -hmm. schemes and, and you adjusted the steady state to be the same. Yes. Uh, does is that condition enough to, to fix all the rates? I, I would assume you still have some freedom there yes. in how you adjust the rates. Yes. So when the steady state is the same, you mean the protein, the steady state for the protein, yes. probably. Yes. So, so how, how do you get rid of the remaining freedom in the rates? No, actually we exploit that uncertainty on those. Typically, that's a different kind of questions. We, I, I learned this term from here, like umbrella sampling. So I, Keep varying those numbers and see whether the, my statistics remains more or less same. I expect the very, so suppose there are too many parameters, I have only two things to fix. I vary them over a range because I know I have my exact expression, right? Yeah. Then I compute my first process time and see how they vary as a function of the variance of those parameters. But the, these these relations that you then have, this, they are, this they are always, of the they are always passage this. time, they are not dependent on your choice of the remaining rates. Because you can see from here, this is always plus one greater than one, this is always less than one. Mm -hmm. That is independent of their individual values. These constants are universally true. Okay, thanks. I have another question if I'm allowed. In in your model with the, with the polymerase, that also gets synthesized. There it's, it's not quite clear to me what the biological situation is that you have in mind because you have a, a polymerase that gets synthesized also, but you have ribosomes that are just present. Yeah, so this feedback loop 
typically the uh, I think the motivation for constructing this model, I mean motivation for these guys for constructing the model is that some there, <coughs> there is a constant in the system in terms of the ribosome numbers. So they, I think a simple way to do that thing is introducing some feedback. Okay, but that, that looks very artificial to me. Uh, probably, uh, probably you are right. So I don't know whether this is any realistic, I, I don't know. Okay, thanks. Okay, sorry, Anand, I had yeah, a related sure. question. That's why probably I have been given this again. See, when you say ribosome number, to my knowledge, ribosome doesn't exist as ribosome. No. So ribosomes, you know, they are actually assembled at the initiation point. So small subunit first, you know, scans and finds the binding site. And then the large subunit comes and binds. And after they have released the protein, these are detached. And then, you know, they can be recycled. So uh, conservation of ribosome number is something that is an assumption probably, I don't know how uh, crucial it is, but that is something you know, worth looking at. Uh, if recycling is allowed rather than conservation, how the results are going to change? Sure. That's just a comment. Sure. This one, oh sorry. Proteins are produced from that uh, RNA, right? And these proteins map polymerase again, which you take as a loop, right? But this protein sigma, right? Transcription factor, which is also a protein. So yes. why don't you account that in that loop as well? And the proteins, the RNA polymerase, which you make, right? Which are also being used in the transcription of other genes, right? So it's not that straightforward, right? Okay, it will give you more complexity, yes. That will, uh, yeah, so you I want to say that this also I can say P1 and P2, and there will be some dynamics for P1 as well. Something like that, right? Yeah, in principle it can be done, but I guess it will be more complex thing to do. Numerically one can check, analytical calculations I don't know. Is Um, what you're getting is a distribution of numbers. So your variance is Fano factor, not randomness parameter. So if yes, you exactly. Add, uh, so it's Fano factor. So the other uh, thing that you have made your rate parameters time dependent, or are they time independent? Yeah, only in the first one for the transcription thing, it was time uh, dependent. If everything else is fixed. Okay. So you can only determine by comparing with the experiment the rate parameters, which you have many. Okay, that's it. Thank you. So if there are no other questions, uh, let us thank Anando once again.